Do you know that there is only one God in three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you know that Jesus said he is the only way to heaven, and his death and resurrection bring forgiveness of sins to all who believe? Welcome to the Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study God's Word, the Bible, together. Welcome to the Pastor Study. In the New Testament, Jesus heals people a lot. And then Jesus ascends back to heaven, and the church goes out, and in the New Testament, the church heals people a lot. And maybe you're watching this program, and you've had an ailment for a long time, and you've asked Jesus to heal you, and you're wondering, why doesn't he heal me? <laughs> well, that's the, the lesson today. I hope by the end of this half hour, you will know two things. Number one, Jesus does heal you. And number two, even when he doesn't heal you, in another way, he's healing you. So would you take out your Bible, turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, and let's learn about healing today. Let's, let's pray. Father, we do pray for people that are suffering in their physical bodies, in their spirits, in their mental uh, life, in their marriage, in their finances. God, we would pray you are a God of healing. We pray that today you would heal people. And Lord, if for some reason you don't, show us what you're doing. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 29. And immediately after Jesus and the disciples had come out of the synagogue, let me stop you right there. Here's the first lesson for today. Jesus worshipped regularly. He was weekly at the synagogue. Do you worship regularly? If Jesus needed it, <laughs> you better believe we need it. And it might save your life. There's a story of an elderly man who went to church every Sunday. One Sunday he did not show up. And people think, well, that's strange. I wonder, wonder where Ed is. So a few of the members went over to his house, looked in the window. There he was lying on his back on the living room floor. They broke in, got an ambulance, took, saved his life that he was in church every week. You know, there was a, a church that had a sign in front of it that said C-H blank blank C-H. And it said, what's missing? And the answer is, you are <laughs> church. Jesus went to synagogue regularly, verse 29. And immediately they came out of the synagogue. They came into the house of Simon, that's Peter, and Andrew with James and John. Just for a second, I want to talk about Peter's house. Do you know they think they probably discovered Peter's house in Capernaum. Uh, they, they excavated Capernaum, ancient Capernaum, and there's one house that's small like the rest of them, but has been overbuilt, has been plastered with sayings on it like, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. And they really do think that the early, early church used to make pilgrimages and they built over Peter's house. I mean, uh, as I was coming to the studio today, I saw my old Grimm's fairy tale book. I've had this since I was like 12 years old. And, and here's my Bible. Some people think they're the same thing. I mean, the Bible has nice stories, but they're all made up. No, they're not. We have something called archaeology. And if, if you wonder whether there's, a, there, whether there's any good evidence for the Christian faith, get a book by Josh McDowell called Evidence that demands a verdict. And look at some of the archaeology that's been dug up. All right. But I digress. Back to Mark chapter 1, verse 30. Now Simon, that's Peter's mother-in-law, was lying sick with the fever. And immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. Here's the next lesson. Peter was married. He had a mother-in-law. Most of the apostles were married. The Apostle Paul was not, but he wrote this, 1 Corinthians 9. Do not Barnabas and I have the right to take along a believing wife, as the other apostles do and the brothers of the Lord and Peter? 
And then he writes this in 1 Timothy 4, false teachers forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything, and includes marriage, everything created by God is good. Nothing's to be rejected if it is, to be, if it is received with thanksgiving. And then Hebrews 13 says, let marriage be held in honor by all. Most of the apostles were married. In 1123 AD, the Roman Catholic Church at its first Lateran Council, that's when they officially forbid priests to be married. But before then, priests were married. And let me read you some of the statistics. In the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Los Angeles, they have now paid $640 million to settle claims by over 500 victims of sex abuse by priests, including the above settlement. Get this, the Roman Catholic Church has now paid over $2 billion to settle all the sex abuse claims against it. In the process, five Roman Catholic dioceses have filed for bankruptcy. Oh. Back in the Middle Ages, Martin Luther was a Catholic monk. He started out as a Catholic monk. There, back then, there was so much immorality between nuns and monks that finally Luther said, let them get married. <laughs> and, and Luther's point was, it's fine to be a pastor, a preacher, and married. And if you forbid that, you're inviting mischief. Let's look at verse 31. And Jesus came to her, the mother-in-law, and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever, fever left her, and she began to serve them. Here's the next lesson. We are healed to serve. Why did Jesus heal you? Why did he save you? So you'd serve him. Many years ago, there was a famous preacher by the name of D.L. Moody. And he was up preaching one day, and he sees in the congregation a young woman named Malamo, who had converted a year and a half earlier. And in his sermon, he comes down from the pulpit and he says, Mala, what are you doing for the Lord? And then he went over and he took her hand and kind of took her out into the aisle, turned her around, pushed her a little bit toward the door and said, Mala, go out and do something for the Lord. <laughs> Well, that little push sent her half away around the world. She became a missionary in Africa. For decades, she, she labored bringing people to Christ, de died at age 90. So my question for you today is, are you doing anything to serve the Lord? I heard a great sermon, and the pastor bemoaned the fact that American Christians, when they retire, Instead of using their retirement years to serve the Lord in some way, they retire to Florida, walk the beach, and get a seashell collection. And this pastor said, what are these Christians going to do on Judgment Day? Say, look, God, aren't these pretty seashells? And no, no, listen, if, if you're retired or if you're 10, find something to do to serve the Lord. That's why he healed you. Verse 32. And when evening had come, after the sun had set, they began bringing to Jesus all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city gathered at the door. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases. Here's the next lesson. The church should heal the sick. In this verse, Jesus is healing the sick. But then he goes to heaven again and sends out the church, and he says, Church, now you heal the sick. And here's the verse, James chapter 5. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another, that you may be healed. So if you're sick, have you done this? Have you called the pastor of your church? You know, uh, pastor, I'd like you to get the anointing with oil by the elders. I've seen amazing things happen. Uh, years ago, here's a dear Christian woman of our church. The doctor tells her, 
your lungs were filled with tumors, it was pretty much over. So she comes up to the altar, would you anoint me? So we, the elders and I prayed over her, anointed her with oil. She goes back to the doctor. The doctor says, I don't get this, but the tumors are gone. And she lived for years after that. <laughs> I have been limping on and off for two years. Not, I don't limp all the time, but now and then I limp because I've got a knee problem. I, the doctor says, bone on bone arthritis, Tom, you, you're going to probably need a, a knee replacement eventually. So I went to my pastor. I said, can you get the elders, because it does say elders, plural. Could you, pastor, get some elders and anoint me with oil? That was, I don't know, was that five months ago, four months ago? The difference was immediate. I mean, I used to have to rub this ointment on my knee that I'm not sure it ever worked anyway. I haven't had to go for the ointment for four or five months. Now, I still kind of feel it now and then, but the difference is amazing. So, God heals through the church. But even when he doesn't heal you, he heals you through the church. Let me explain. In 1973... I was 19 years old. My dad was dying of a brain tumor, my Catholic dad. They gave him six months to a year. But in his last months, and I went with him a few times, there was this, there was this charismatic Episcopal church near our house. Now, some Episcopal churches are very unbiblical today, very pro things you shouldn't be pro but this was a good biblical episcopal church and every wednesday sick people would come to the church they'd have a worship service the pastor would preach uh, people would go to the altar uh, they'd get holy communion the pastor would anoint them with oil and pray for their healing now my dad didn't get healed he died of the brain tumor but didn't he get healed i mean sometimes god doesn't heal you one way but he got communion and, and Christian fellowship, the, the last months of his life. God uses the church one way or another to heal. Look at verse 34. And he cast out many demons. Here's the next lesson. The church should do exorcisms. Um, Jesus does exorcism here, but in the book of Acts, after Christ ascends, the, the early church did exorcisms. So if you feel you might have a problem with a demon or something, you might want to call the pastor and say, can I get some prayer with the elders over what's going on? Verse 34, But Jesus was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. <laughs> Here's the next lesson. Demons have supernatural knowledge. The demoniacs knew who Jesus was when nobody else did. Recently I got an email, Pastor Brock, is it possible the demon possession in the New Testament is really mental illness? And I said, no, because why would people with mental illness know who Jesus was when nobody... That, that doesn't work. There is a supernatural evil knowledge in the occult, but where to stay away from that? I mean, Christian, we get our supernatural knowledge from the Bible, we don't go to uh, Ouija boards or the occult or um, dial 900 psychic or to seances or to tarot cards. I mean, I, I remember as a 12-year-old, my friend had a Ouija board. And four of us sat there with this Ouija board between us. And it was spooky. There was some supernatural knowledge going on. And we just kind of could put it away. But, uh, you know, <laughs> my friends think I'm weird. When I go to a Chinese restaurant... I don't even read the fortune cookie. I eat it, but I don't read it. So just stay away from the evil supernatural knowledge of the occult. All right, for the last part of the sermon now, we're going to ask the question, well, why doesn't God heal me? Let me make seven quick points. Point number one, think of all the times he has. <laughs> Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits, who forgives you all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. I mean, you might have a certain disease, but think of all the colds you've had, the flu you've had, the you know, headaches you've had. Think of all the times God has healed you. And here is one reason maybe you're not healed. I say maybe. Unbelief. 
is one possibility. It says in Matthew 13, Jesus did not do many mighty works there in Nazareth because of their unbelief. So the second thing I want to say is unbelief is a possibility for why you're not healed. Um, the, uh, you might say to yourself, well, I don't want to go up and get anointing with oil by the elders. I think that's kooky. I don't want that. I'm not a Jesus freak. Okay, then don't get healed. <laughs> I remember years ago, I said to this Christian gal, do you have a, an aspirin? I got a headache. She said, well, have you prayed about it? I thought, well, you know, I haven't. You know, sometimes the reason we don't get healed, we don't even think of consulting God. <laughs> Um, another reason we might not get healed, and I, again I say maybe because this is not always true, sin is one possibility. Jesus said in John 15, he had healed a man, and afterward Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. I think Jesus is teaching your sin can cause sickness. Not always, but it can. I mean, if I have sex outside of marriage and get herpes, well, there's a connection between my sin and sickness. If I get drunk a lot and get cirrhosis of the liver, well, there's a connection. If I'm a glutton and eat a lot, I can get uh, heart disease and die early. So not always, but sometimes there's a connection between sin and sickness. But again, I'm going to quickly say not always. When you're sick, it's not always because you did something wrong. I remember ministering to a man in a wheelchair and he was kind of crying, and he said, you know, Tom, I went to this healing service, and the preacher said to me, you know, if you had enough faith, you'd get out of that wheelchair. And he said, Tom, I do believe in Jesus. I do. And I thought, shame on that preacher. <laughs> if, if you go to a church where they teach, if you believe hard enough, you're always going to get healed. You're always going to be prosperous. You need to hear this verse, John chapter 9. The disciples were asking Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So, sometimes you're sick, not because you did something wrong or not because you don't have enough faith. Sometimes things are for the glory of God. I remember an old Lutheran pastor, a real saint, who got bone cancer, died of bone cancer. But he said to the people of our church, don't pray for my healing. This is for the glory of God. <laughs> Next thing to say about healing. Ultimate healing is future. Revelation chapter 21. God will, future tense, wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more, neither shall there be pain anymore. All the pain and suffering doesn't end until the second coming of Christ. Now, let me explain something called realized eschatology. I learned about this in seminary. Eschatology is the last things, the things that happen at the second coming at the very end. The Jews believed in the last things, that the Christ would come and everyone would be healed, the dead will be raised, and it will be uh, perfect. Well, during Jesus' three years of ministry, he did some of the stuff that wasn't supposed to happen until the end. He raised the dead. He healed people, and it's called realized eschatology, that some of the things that aren't going to happen until the end of time do start happening in our lives today because of Christ. But then the professor talked about what he called over-realized eschatology, and he's criticizing the health and wealth preachers, and he said, uh, some preachers demand that right now I'm going to have total healing and I'm going to have total financial prosperity. And no, that's over. We don't get that till the very end. You might get it, some realized eschatology today in your life, but we can't name it and claim it and demand it because a lot of it's saved for the end. Next thing to say about healing the ministry of the thorn. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 said, I have this thorn in my flesh. Three, and we don't know what it was. I think it's intentionally left fuzzy so Christians throughout the ages could fill in the blank with their own problem, whatever it is. But it might have been a health problem. It might have been an enemy. But Paul had this thorn in the flesh. And three times I asked the Lord, take it away. And God said, no, my, this is to help you be humble. It's for my glory. 
So sometimes God doesn't take your thorn away because it's God's going to leave it there because it's somehow for your good and his glory. Tim Hansel was a Christian uh, minister, and he said this. He's died now, but he said, I have prayed hundreds, if not thousands of times, for the Lord to heal me, and he finally healed me of the need to be healed. (laughs) Next thing to say about healing. God also heals through medicine. 1 Timothy 5, Paul the Apostle writes, Timothy, take a little wine. Don't just drink water. Take a little wine for the sake of your frequent stomach ailments. In that verse, Paul is not saying, Timothy, where's your faith? Name it and claim it. He's saying, take your medicine. And the man who wrote the book of Acts and the book of Luke, Luke, was a doctor. So praise God that he uses medicine to heal us. Um, I've been taking a thyroid pill for 25 years. 25 years ago, I asked God to heal me. He didn't, so I take my pill every day. And instead of saying, well, Lord, why don't you heal my thyroid? Just take your medicine and thank God that we live in America where we get good medicine. Last reason, sometimes Jesus doesn't heal me. Sometimes it's time to go home. It says this in 2 Kings 13. Now when Elisha had fallen sick with the, Ill, with the illness of which he was to die. Now to all the faith, health, and wealth preachers, they need to hear that verse. Nothing was wrong with Elisha's faith. He ra- Elisha he raised people from the dead, if you remember some of the stories. But no, nothing was wrong with his faith. God just wanted to take him home. And sometimes, Christian, God doesn't heal you down here because he wants to heal you up there. <laughs> and I've said this before, I'll say it again. I really think when we get to heaven, we're going to look back at our time on earth and think, why did I scratch and claw to stay down there? <laughs> All right, let, let's review this. Why doesn't Jesus heal me? Well, seven words to say. Number one, think of all the times he has. Number two, unbelief is one possibility. Number three, sin is a possibility, but not always. Number four, ultimate healing is future. Don't do over-realized eschatology. Number five, know about the ministry of the thorn. Number six, know that God does heal through medicine. And number seven, know that the time will come when he just wants to take you home. I close with this. Here was a preacher who said these words. I would rather heal, excuse me, I would rather save one human soul than heal a thousand human bodies. Let me repeat that. I would rather save one human soul than heal a thousand human bodies. Point being, what's the use of healing somebody's body? Because they're still going to die someday, and if they don't have Christ, they're going to hell. And his point is, is valid. It's more important for us that we're saved and know Christ than if we heal people's bodies. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we ask Pastor Brock questions regarding the Bible. Pastor Brock, our first question today is, mm-hmm. do all churches do anointing with oil for healing? I don't think they do it at my church. You know, a lot of churches don't, but James chapter 5 says, do. (laughs) And what we used to do at our church for years, Mm -hmm. at the end of every service, we would say, if you need prayer for any reason or anointing with oil for healing, there will be elders up at the front altar who will pray for you after church. I think that's wonderful. Me too. And that's where you see some miracles happen. Mm -hmm. So. All right. What do you think of churches that have altar calls where they ask people to come forward publicly to receive Christ? I think it's one way to get the fish into the boat. Mm-hmm. But some people are, so, we need to have an altar call every Sunday. So, because that's the, it's not the way people get saved. I mean, how many altar calls were there in the New Testament? Billy Graham was big, big on saying we need mm-hmm. to do it publicly because that's how Jesus called the 12 disciples. Well, kind of did he? He did it that one time, but do you see it anywhere else? And mm-hmm. so there's all kinds of ways to get fish in the boat. The norm is, People hear the gospel preached and they believe and are saved. They get mm-hmm. baptized. Mm-hmm. Uh, but having an altar call, we've done them sometimes, and I think nothing's wrong with it, but it's not the only way people can get saved. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah. How do I know if God wants me to get married, and to whom? 
Well, I think you've got, uh, you, the norm does seem to be most people get married. Mm -hmm. And so you pray about it, Lord. And, but some people have the gift of, of celibacy. And 1 Corinthians 7, God is calling them to be single. Well, you pray it through. If you've got a very strong sex drive, <laughs> Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, better, better to marry than burn with lust. So if you've got a very strong sex drive, that's probably an indicator that, but not necessarily, you pray for God's wisdom and see what happens. And make sure you know the person. Right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. All right, here's another letter from a viewer. What are some questions a couple should ask themselves before marriage? How can they know if they are right for one another? Well, the Bible says if you're a Christian, you marry a Christian. Mm -hmm. So if you're in love with your non-believing boyfriend and he's not a believer, mm -hmm. you don't marry him, hoping that, well, I'll convert him after, he, after we're married. I've so, I have so many women who could tell you heartbreaking stories thinking he'll convert and he never does. Mm -hmm. Even, the, well, once we're married, I'll go to church with you, and he never does. Mm -hmm. So number one, make sure you're, if you're a Christian, you marry a Christian. Also, the way I understand uh, 1 Corinthians 7 and Matthew 18, if you're married and get divorced, you should stay single mm -hmm. unless your prior spouse dies. And Jesus said, if you marry someone who's divorced, you're committing adultery. Mm -hmm. So I, I would make sure I'm marrying a believer. I wouldn't enter into a second marriage unless the prior spouse had died. And then you got to pray through, you know, Lord, is this the right one? Okay. Yeah. My 75-year-old sister won't go to church. She doesn't ask God for forgiveness. I told her she needs to, and she says Jesus is forgiving. He will forgive her when she gets to heaven. I told her that Jesus will say, because she didn't know him when she was alive on earth, that he will say, I don't know you. What can I say to her to make her see that Jesus is so important now? Yeah, you have to convert to Christ before you die. Mm -hmm. There is no second chance after you die. Once the householder, Jesus said, once the householder get up yeah. and shut the door, they'll be standing outside saying, let me in. And, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. So I would say to his sister, you can't put that off. If you think you're going to get saved in heaven, that's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. so there Better you go. to do it now. That's right. Um, Tom, we only have about 30 seconds. Well, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, but I was going to get to this other question. Two people wrote in saying, okay, but I have divorced and married somebody new. Do I get unmarried and be, no, no, 1 Corinthians 6, if you get divorced, that's, I think that was a sin, ask God's forgiveness, but I think you stay in the marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Corinthians, some of you were adulterers, but you were washed of that, so ask God's forgiveness and I'd stay in the marriage. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Have a blessed week. See you next time on The Pastor Study. Thank you for watching The Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the good news of Jesus Christ because of the generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org or write The Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.